Hello there and welcome to the Ted's Notebook Guide to North London Parks, also known as One Man and His Selfie Stick. So we have plenty to talk about. Uh, it's another notebook. I wasn't expecting to do another one uh, so soon. But seeing as we have so much news, so much things going on, we have uh, developments, we have information coming out, we have driver moves, information on a calendar as well, new rules, and we have a quiz. Uh, we thought we'd do uh, another notebook from my evening stroll in, as I said, a North London park. Um, it's a bit windy, so uh, uh, sorry if you get a bit of wind noise here and there, but I have hidden the, uh, the microphone under my shirt like a, like a sound man. Well, Tiger, our sound man, once told me to do. Well, he didn't tell me to do. Whenever it's noisy, he says, can I just put that in your shirt? So I do it. So that's why um, uh, the, the mic is hidden. But forgive any, any wind noise. But there's plenty uh, to talk about because, uh, well, we'll do a special notebook this week with all of the comings and goings, and then we'll go back to doing uh, every team uh, next week, shall we? But this is an important week for Formula One in general because my first title in, the note, in my page is General F1. The reason it's such an important week in the future of Formula One is because we're getting the raft of new rules agreed for the future to transform the way teams compete with each other. Now, if you start off with the general principle that to be quick in Formula One, you need to spend money. And the more you spend, the faster you go. That has really defined who wins in Formula One and who doesn't. That's about to change because what they're doing and what it looks like we're going to have agreement on towards the end of this week is that all the teams are going to agree to level the playing field on spending. That's what we're calling is effectively the budget cap. So if you level the playing field on spending, no team can spend more than 145 million US dollars, excluding things like engine bills, marketing, the top three uh, team executive salaries and the driver salaries. All right, they are pretty big caveats, I'll give you that. But as a headline figure of 145 million US dollars, which is still a lot of money, it's less than the 300 million that it was last, last year and the years before and when the spending arms race was going on. So you see what I mean? It's just leveling the bar. It's leveling the playing field uh, of what people can spend in Formula One. And that means that not only we should have a more sustainable Formula One, especially in this upcoming uh, financial difficulties that we're going to have post COVID-19, but makes it more sustainable, makes it more competitive. It means hopefully that it won't be the top step of the podium, won't be the dominance of the top three teams, that we will get other teams able to win in F1 going forward, which is really what we all want, isn't it? So uh, just to get some variety. You know, it was Williams who was the last team uh, to win in F1. Pastor Maldonado back in uh, uh, 2012 outside uh, the top three of uh, Ferrari. Hello, just saying hello to one of my neighbours. Um, uh, outside of Ferrari, Red Bull and uh, uh, Mercedes, of course. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's very important. So new rules um, coming in with the, the budget cap. Um, that, uh, that means that we're going to save money with rule changes as well because we're going to have a freeze on various bits of development. So you'll have less and en fewer engines, you'll have fewer things that you can do with the car. Certainly from this year to next year, we'll have a big cap on what you can do with the car, which will save money. We'll have longer life gearboxes, we'll have spec parts, we'll have parts that they can change, things that the people in the grandstands don't see, like gearbox casings and uh, wishbones and stuff like that. They'll manage to really button down the spending on that and make sure that teams don't have to go crazy on spending. And that's the new rules that we hope are going to be agreed uh, this week, which are going to close up the competition. So it's good for F1 and hopefully good for us watching. Now, do the teams like it? Not particularly. Um, well, all the teams with, sort of, you know, Red Bull, Ferrari and uh, Mercedes don't particularly like it, but they have to live with it. It's a compromise and it might help them survive in Formula One when the big car companies actually come to, to decide whether to stay in F1 or not. All the teams down from there do like it. Some of the smaller teams would uh, would like it to be a little bit less than one, four, five million. We're, we're trying to get it down, but they've compromised on that. Ferrari are saying, you know, for, for, for Ferrari, for Red Bull and, and for Mercedes, you know, it, it is going to be difficult with their people. You know, they, they budget for the amount of people they need to go racing and um, they know what that is and that's their budget. They've got a 900 people 
thousand people maybe, they've got the money for that. If they suddenly have less money to spend, what are they going to do with those people? So there might be some redundancies. They might have to move staff onto other projects. That's what Ferrari have been talking about. Do they look at other projects? Well, what they could, what would it be? Ferrari could go, I don't know, IndyCar racing. I suppose that's possible. That's been mooted. Um, but a Ferrari and Indy cars, would they use one of their engines, a Ferrari engine? Would they use a, a Honda or a Chevrolet? Difficult to see. Would it be their chassis? Would they get Delara to build one? I don't know. And how many people would it take off the, the racing team that they couldn't find work for anymore under a budget cap and give them work on IndyCar? So uh, I don't know. I'm not sure whether, uh, whether they will do other um, racing series as well, but certainly they will have to find... Uh, you're right, you're right, Corgi. Whatever, it's not a Corgi. Jack Russell. All right, Fido, calm down. Oh, he's think he's seen a squirrel. Oh, he's seen a squirrel. Has he seen a squirrel? Oh, he's seen a squirrel up there. They love squirrels, don't they, dogs? I've got no idea, never had a dog, but there, so there you go. Right, um, so what do they do? Well, we'll see what, what Ferrari do, but otherwise they have to uh, lump it then. Um, uh, and what else? Yes. Well, that's the next thing in my general F1 is, is F1 going to get racing? Well, that's the next thing. And that is still a very, very big question. Um, there's lots still to be done. Uh, we do have some more confirmed dates. We don't have a whole calendar or anything like that. Um, I'm not really gonna guess at a calendar, but I'll tell you what the, 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 they're aiming at at the moment. So we have Austria, the Austrian Grand Prix on Sunday the 5th of July. We have uh, the Red Bull Ring Grand Prix. I don't know what they're going to call it. Red Bull Ring 2, it seems to be called uh, at the moment. Uh, a week later, on the 12th of July. Then the British Grand Prix on the 26th of July. This is all behind closed doors. So I'm sorry. We'd love to see you. And it'd be a great event, all of you who had tickets to the British Grand Prix. But there are no fans at any of these events so far. So it's going to be weird. It's going to be like a sort of glorified test session. No atmosphere. It's horrible. But anyway, we'll, you know, needs must. And we'll have fans back whenever, as soon as we can. Um, British Grand Prix 26th of July, then Silverstone 2, or British Grand Prix 2, I don't think they can call it British Grand Prix, but anyway, on the 2nd of August. And then it seems like we're going European, if they'll have us, and if we can leave the UK and come back into it, which is an interesting question, I'll ask you, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Hungary, Barcelona, Hockenheim maybe, uh, Spa-Francorchamps, and Monza. There's no Zandvoort, uh, because they want to do it with, uh, with, with a crowd. Um, there's no France, the Paul Ricard, not being talked about at the moment. Um, and then it seems like we go to Baku and Sochi. Uh, then China, Japan, Vietnam, question mark. No Singapore. It seems at the moment that Singapore have... Um, it, they say it's not possible to run it safely in a city uh, with all the distancing requirements and the safety and the, and the coronavirus requirements in a city it's not possible and they don't want to run it without a crowd uh, as well and how would they stop people watching it you see what i mean in singapore it wouldn't really be possible so uh, singapore seems not to be possible in the current climate which is uh, a big shame but that's to be uh, confirmed um china japan vietnam then usa mexico big question over them still with uh, they seem to be a month behind us in europe uh, and a couple of months behind asia in the whole uh, covid19 uh, pandemic um, and then a couple in bahrain maybe maybe one or two uh, in Abu Dhabi as well. But uh, yeah, so you can see they're the ones being talked about. So at the moment, there's no Zandvoort, no Canada. that seems to be um, not included in any of the calendars that uh, are going around. No Singapore and no France. Of course, there's no Monaco, which would have been this weekend, but we all know already know uh, about that. And no Melbourne, but we already know about that. But UK quarantine, and this is the big question, not only for the British teams who, if they can go to Austria, come back they need an exception from the seems to be incoming uk quarantine rules that are coming in at the beginning of june that when you come back you have a mandatory must stay at home which can be checked whether it will be checked or not is a different thing must stay at home uk quarantine for two weeks which would preclude a british grand prix because that's just a week later so they can have one or the other it seems that they can't have both and it seems that they're far down the austria path that that puts, if that quarantine rule does come in, uh, the efficiency of which you might have your own views on, and plenty of people are saying, well, that's all well and good, but where was this in March? Horse and stable door and bolted, but uh, I won't get into that. Um, but this quarantine rule, if it does come in, 
that would really upset the apple cart and manda if, if, if formula one teams drivers and engineers can't get an exception to that uk quarantine rule then that puts the whole thing the whole series uh, this year in some doubt because they're going to have to uh, well run two teams they could run two race teams I suppose there are enough people uh, and they're going to have smaller teams so that's possible you can have race team A and then goes into quarantine and then race team B does the next race but I mean that's being a bit complicated isn't it so it still seems to hang on UK quarantine uh, rules so um, well if you know Boris ask him to let the uh, give the UK team F1 teams a uh, an exemption um, Sorry, I just joked. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, anyway, um, what else is going on? Right, uh, the car factories, the F1 factories, are still in shutdown, the mandatory shutdown uh, I told you about last time. But the engine departments, the engine factories, have reopened as of the beginning of this week. And this is important because there are some engine discussions going on as to what we're going to do with uh, how many engine elements you're allowed for this year. And what you're going to do with engine specs as well because no engines have actually started the year a team could if they started work now or developed a new engine start the season in austria with a higher spec than they were going to start in melbourne if you see what i mean um, i suppose that's possible but uh, uh, because those engines will be being made up now they don't need to use the engines that they sent to melbourne which might have been you know sat in a packing case and might have had some corrosion if moisture got in they can build up new engines in those engine factories which have now opened together with the uh, with the social distancing and all of that they can build them up and they can be ready to go with no f f uh, fear of any sort of corrosion or anything like that while they've been sitting there since uh, melbourne so that's what's been going on the engine fa factories are back um it seems like at the moment if there are between one and eight or nine races, then you get one engine and power unit and all the bits of it per uh, for, 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 for the for the season. If there are between uh, nine and sort of sixteen races, which seems the most likely this year, then you're allowed two. Uh, and if there are more than that, then you're allowed three. Uh, Sixteen to twenty or eighteen, then you're allowed three. That's the kind of feeling we're getting at the moment but that will be confirmed in some of the rules that are coming out uh, this year um well th th this week i should say uh, you, the factories are allowed 10 people at the moment in them to work on long lead time items like if a team decides that it needs a new gearbox design or something like that they can start work on that now remotely i think uh, but if it's particularly long lead, they can ask the FIA uh, to do that or a suspension layout. It can't include any aero bits. So that's the exception uh, to that rule coming in. Um, right. Uh, but otherwise, what's going on in the factories? Well, they're just adapting for physical distancing, aren't they? Um, social distancing. I like to call it physical distancing because that's kind of what it is. Um, so they're, they're moving desks putting screens in where they need to, figuring out how many people can work from home and how many people uh, need to come into the factory. So that's what a lot of the, uh, the teams uh, are doing, just um, yeah, adapting their factories for distancing. And uh, well, talking of fewer people, we have driver moves. So should we get on the driver moves, uh, shall we? And well, it, if you weren't, this is all for 2021, okay? Um, if you're like my wife, who got a surprise when I told her that Sebastian was leaving Ferrari, she said, what? That, wow, that's massive. And I said, no, no, it's for 2021. I said, oh, well, that's next year. Still got this year to go. Yes, we have still got this year uh, to go, but it is still fairly big. Um, if you didn't catch it, Sebastian Vettel is going to leave uh, Ferrari at the end of this year, 2020. And we don't know where he's going to go in 2021. His place at Ferrari is going to be taken by Carlos Sainz Jr., who is uh, leaving McLaren. And his place at McLaren is going to be taken by Daniel Ricciardo, who's leaving Renault. And we don't know who is leaving uh, wherever or coming in from somewhere else to take Daniel Ricciardo's place uh, at Renault. So that's the, that's the big unknown. Um, but we'll go to Mercedes first of all, because that is a possible, is that a possible destination for Sebastian Vettel? Because the big unknown is who's going to go to Renault and what's Seb going to do? Um, Toto Wolff, the Mercedes team boss, did some interviews uh, this week from his home in Austria and said some quite interesting things. You can catch this on Mercedes' uh, YouTube uh, uh, account, one of these um, interviews that they've done, these in-house interviews they've done. Um, but he says it's time, it's given him time for reflection, time with the kids. It's changed this period of lockdown, has changed his life for the better and made me grow as a human being said Toto. Wow, deep. Uh, which um, he's had 
I wonder whether that time for reflection has extended to his drivers. Um, it hasn't officially because Mercedes tell us that they're no closer to deciding the fate of Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas for 2021, who were both out of contract, than they were at the start of the season. They haven't had further discussions in this shutdown with Hamilton or Bottas, had that confirmed uh, by the team. Um, so, but their priority for their drivers after 2020 are their current drivers. So it would seem in this order, Lewis Hamilton, Valtteri Bottas, one and two priority. After that, it would seem to go to Esteban Ocon, who is still linked to the Mercedes. Well, he's still a Mercedes managed driver, even though he's been sort of farmed out to Renault, but he is still a Mercedes managed driver. So Ocon, it seems is three. Russell is four, George Russell. Um, the most junior of the uh, of the young drivers and then it seems like Sebastian Vettel so at the moment Vettel is fifth choice for a Mercedes drive which doesn't look good um, for Sebi but then it has to come into the account and Toto said this is it a good marketing move to have Sebastian Vettel in your team well yes I mean a German driver in a German car would be good Sebastian is popular with the fans he's popular with the public he's popular with the sponsors he's good at developing cars he's good technically as well and I don't know ask yourself this if you're Toto Wolf you've got the option of say Ocon doesn't want to leave Renault or and, and, and Bottas has gone somewhere else for some reason or that's not that's unlikely but anything's possible would you take Sebastian Vettel over George Russell I think you kind of say you would, wouldn't you? I mean, I know Russell's good and they'll have the data on that. And that's the other thing. It's a data driven decision. And that's the crucial thing. And that they'll have all the data on George Russell, but they don't really have any data on Sebastian Vettel. They only have the data about what he's done at Ferrari and other teams and comparing him to his teammate, whether that's Charles Leclerc or Kimi Raikkonen or whatever. Now that may or may not work in Sebastian Vettel's favor, but Mercedes, of course, do have that kind of data on Sebastian Vettel. So I um, don't know how he'll take that. But uh, it is going to take time because, as I said, negotiations with Hamilton and Bottas are dormant. They haven't developed over the shutdown. Mercedes say they're going to go racing. Then they're going to make the decisions on their drivers for 2021. But I don't know. If you're Sebastian Vettel, what would you do? At least with Lewis Hamilton as a teammate, you might get beaten by him because he's well used to the Mercedes uh, team and he might be faster than you but at least at Mercedes you know you're going to get a fair crack of the whip which it seems at Ferrari Sebastian felt that he really wasn't going to get and the more does it, more info we get coming out of people close to Sebastian Vettel like Helmut Marco and 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 even Toto Wolff and Andreas Seidel the people that you hear about why Seb left Ferrari it seems to be more reasons that Ferrari wanted somebody, you know, equal or under Charles Leclerc, which uh, Sebastian felt that it wasn't him. And um, he, Sebastian felt this, I think, last year when he's gone from four-time world champion team leader to kind of, you know, what is he? He didn't feel that he was less valuable or he was less than Charles Leclerc and shouldn't be treated like it. So really, it was a fairly easy decision to leave, I think. Um, uh, but will Sebastian get to prove himself in an equal car to Leclerc? So, yeah, this was a thought I had. You know, the car doesn't suit Sebastian at the moment, or last year's Ferrari didn't suit Sebastian in his driving style. He never felt he was at his best. This year's car doesn't seem to be a particularly uh, good, massive improvement on that. We asked him that in testing, and Seb kind of said, well, it's better in some ways, but in some ways um, it's the same. But have we seen Seb with a peculiar car that he likes in his driving style against Leclerc. And I don't think we have. And then Seb might feel then that you can't really give a true read of my abilities when I don't have a car which I can't, which, which I can't really drive to my liking to compare me to Charles Leclerc. So um, I think that's, that's fair enough. Whether that's a, a drawback of Seb's style that he can't bend a car around to any, you know, bend his driving style around to any car is a different discussion. But um, uh, anyway, um, otherwise, yeah, Helmut Marco, that's right, uh, said Sebastian didn't get the support from Ferrari and pulled the plug, uh, which I think is, uh, is probably uh, fair to say. Sebastian did, it seems, have discussions with McLaren. There wasn't a contract offer, but there very much were uh, discussions. He doesn't really want to go to Renault, uh, I sense. So what does he do? Well, he still loves racing. Does he take a year off and see? I think he probably will. Um, 
he'll he'll wait and see what Mercedes do. Uh, and but if there isn't room at the uh, three pointed star, then uh, he doesn't really have very many options. Um, but uh, I don't know. I go back to that. Could take a development role with a team, I suppose. But I go back to that line in his press release where he says you have to use your imagination uh, about what you want to do. And I've got a good, I've got a good plan. Um, don't know how to get this idea to Sebastian Vettel. I don't have his number. Uh, I could probably guess at his email address. But uh, he's not going to be watching this rubbish, is he? So anyway, I don't know. An idea for Sebastian Vettel. Launch your own Legends F1 series. You can make it, call it Unpolitically Correct F1. V12 engines, retro cars, can adapt some cars from the 90s or the 80s, stick V12 engines in there. Remember when he retired in Russia? Bring back the V12 engines. Um, and let them race. No rules. No silly rules like the rules that did him in winning the Canadian Grand Prix. He'd love that, wouldn't he? You'd call it Retro F1 or Politically Incorrect F1. You could even have grid girls if you want. Um, <laughs> I uh, don't know how Sebastian Vettel feels about the removal of grid girls. But anyway, you see what I mean? Unpolitically correct F1. That might be an idea. I think that's an idea. Seb should go off and develop unpolitically correct F1 uh, in his, uh, his um, semi-retirement. He could be the race director, organizer, and driver. Get lots of cool drivers out there. Wurtz would do it. Brundle would do it. Herbert would do it. Jensen might do it. Yeah, good idea. He'll never do it. Anyway, it's a nice idea. Um, right, but what else is going on? Uh, well, Ferrari. Well, let's do that, shall we? Um, Charles Leclerc seems to be uh, happy at the moment. Uh, he's become a fashion model. Uh, oh, just go under this dark tree. I hope he's still got me. Um, he has been announced as the brand ambassador for Giorgio Armani's Made to Measure collection for summer, autumn uh, 2020. If you have a look at the photos online, he looks very handsome in there. He's got a uh, quiff, a bit like the late Luke Perry in 90210, but he looks very handsome with it. And um, uh, so he's uh, sort of followed Lewis Hamilton into fashion a bit, uh, but uh, he's got no haircut. So he's sort of following the rest of us with uh, lockdown haircuts, which is ironic seeing as his mum is a hairdresser in Monaco. Cuts David Coulthard's hair. Um, and what else is going on? Oh yeah, there's a story about his girlfriend, uh, Charlotte. So she was locked out of the, uh, of the flat and um, she couldn't get in, she forgot her, she forgot her key. And uh, she was WhatsApp, she was texting Charles and trying to get him to open the door, but uh, he was too busy engrossed in his sim racing. So she thought the only way to do it, having waited 25 minutes and rung the bell or knocked on the door, couldn't get anyone else to let her in, was to sign up to his Twitch account, uh, pay some money to be a registered person who can text the driver and text him saying, Charles, I'm outside, please come and open the door. And he eventually saw it uh, and, uh, and let her in. I thought it was quite funny. Um, I'm sure they'll, sure they'll get over it. Oh, he must have got hell for that. Um, but uh, yeah, Science has been confirmed as Leclerc's teammate. And uh, with Science at 21, uh, Science at 25 and Leclerc at 21, that is the youngest Ferrari pairing in modern history, you would have to say. And we have a quiz today. So quiz question number one. Uh, with Carlos, which is Charles in Spanish, and Charles, we have these teammates who have the same name. When was the last time, or can you think of other times in F1 where two teammates in the same team have had the same name? Answers at the end of the notebook. Uh, what else is going on with Charles Leclerc? Yeah, um, does Sainz think he can beat Leclerc? I think he probably does. Does Leclerc have off days? Yes, he does. Um, and, but that's really going to be interesting because science isn't going to be a pushover, uh, is he? So that's going to be a really interesting dynamic at Ferrari uh, next year. Carlos Sainz said goodbye with a, a little VT, a little video, a letter to McLaren. Nice idea. Don't know where they got that from. Dear Fernando. Anyway, um, and uh, he was just saying effectively how great everyone was and how he likes them. And there's a nice line in there. I thought he said, goodbye, Lando, my Muppet friend. <laughs> I don't know whether he means that, you know, like, oh, you Muppet, or whether he looks like a Muppet. But anyway, I thought that was quite cute. Uh, and um, yeah, so he's, he's off with, uh, with uh, good, good terms. I don't know, actually, whether Ferrari would have had to pay Sainz or McLaren for the option, taking the option on Sainz's contract, because Sainz was still signed for McLaren. The option was still on McLaren's side uh, for this year. So I wonder if Ferrari had to pay McLaren for, uh, for Science's services. Um, we'll find out uh, eventually. 
Um, what else? Uh, yeah, Zach Brown, the McLaren boss, has been pretty punchy uh, talking to uh, the media. He's might well be off Ferrari's Christmas card list. He said, Ferrari doesn't seem to be a happy place at the moment. Um, okay. <laughs> right uh, but uh, you know we're pleased to have taken Carlos Sainz um, uh, J Jensen Button I thought had an interesting thing to say that Daniel Ricciardo uh, as we've already said Sainz's replacement at McLaren wouldn't have fit in at the old Ron Dennis led McLaren but very much does fit in at the new Zach Brown led McLaren I think that's absolutely right can you imagine uh, Ron with uh, Daniel Ricciardo probably wouldn't have worked out uh, very well but anyway um, as for McLaren, they say they were pretty far down the road with, with Daniel Ricciardo. We like where he is in his career. Um, so uh, they're happy to sign him. Um, and Lando Norris, my Muppet friend, is up against a guy in Daniel Ricciardo at the top of his game. And this is going to be really tough. Lando Norris might have thought he had it tough with Carlos Sainz last year. Ricciardo, great qualifier, awesome racer bit older than, well, quite a fair bit older than Lando Norris, eight or nine years older than Lando Norris, and um, quick in all, con in, in all conditions. So uh, Lando's really got it uh, to prove uh, next year. But Ricardo, it makes sense for him. He's going in straight in as a team leader. He's got uh, McLaren with a Mercedes engine when he gets there. Pressure on McLaren to do a decent car uh, because they'll certainly have a good uh, engine in the car. Um, and they'll have the uh, pink Mercedes to race against, the racing point to race against in that kind of midfield. So real pressure on McLaren to do a good car to go with that Mercedes engine. And another quiz. Next year, McLaren will have, and this pleases me, being someone who likes this kind of thing, uh, con uh, sequential numbers, since the drivers were able to choose their numbers. So um, since that happened, you've had numbers all over the place. But now, Daniel Ricciardo is number three, Lando Norris is number four, and so they'll have sequential numbers. When did that last happen in a team? In a driver selected number, this is fun, isn't it? Driver selected numbers, when has the team had consecutive numbers? It has happened before since the drivers were able to choose their numbers, but McLaren will have three and four next year. I'll tell you the answers at the end of the notebook. Uh, as for Sainz, it's his uh, fourth team in six years. So there are some teams that Carlos Sainz hasn't raced for yet, but he's gone Toro Rosso, Renault, McLaren and Ferrari, following Alain Prost, Gerhard Berger and Kimi Raikkonen in going from McLaren to Ferrari. Right, let's wrap that up because it feels like we've done uh, uh, ages. Um, a move to Renault. Daniel Ricciardo is going to have an awkward year then in 2020 uh, because he's got to go back to the team that he's kind of said, you know, I don't think you're good enough and I'm not really happy here. So I'm not going to a top three team. I'm going to a, a midfield rivals in McLaren. Um, which is going to be pretty awkward going back uh, into Renault. Don't know whether there's going to be some comeback on that. We'll see. But uh, it's pretty embarrassing for Renault. Uh, Cyril Abitbull said in his statement, in Formula One, reciprocated confidence, unity and commitment are critical values for a works team. Ooh, is he saying that Daniel Ricciardo didn't have commitment, uh, confidence or unity? Well, it seems that way. But... Cyril seems to have landed on his feet again because he could have a choice of Sebastian Vettel if Vettel wants to go there, which I don't think he does, or Fernando Alonso. So is Fernando Alonso going to come back and go to Renault? Well, would he? Does he really want to do that? Plug around in the midfield, hoping, wishing for a podium they weren't able to get up until this point against the pink Mercedes and McLaren with a Mercedes engine and, and then the top three? Ah, Fernando doesn't want to do that, does he? But, well, we'll see. Stranger things have happened. Um, as for Ricardo again, has he been overtaken by the young gang in terms of the top three uh, teams? Well, we will see, but that's just an open question. What does he do next? Well, he seems to be happy. Was Ricardo's time at Renault a waste of? Uh, no, if you consider that um, he wanted out of Red Bull for various, all those different various reasons, uh, and he has earned well out of it as Daniel Ricardo. So I don't think he'll see it as a waste but it is going to be a diff difficult rest of the season. Um, where could Vettel go? Racing Point, it's going to be a good car, but uh, there doesn't seem to be any space there uh, for the next couple of years. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll watch this space. A couple of other lines just as we wrap up before I give you the quiz answers. Um, uh, Alfa Romeo Sauber, uh, it seems like Fred Vasseur is really missing racing, so much so that he's um, uh, carved uh, an F1 logo 
or just the word, the letter F and the number one into his lawn at his place in France. Uh, so have a look at it. Well, here's a, here's a picture of it. It's, uh, it's quite funny. What I like is if you can look very closely at the screen um, is Fred's deadpan face, a kind of, I didn't want to do this, but I'm really bored. So I just thought I would. It's Fred's, un one of Fred's, tra tra Fred Vasseur's trademark unhappy faces which uh, I thought was quite funny when you have a look at it close up. Um, and Williams then, uh, the last team that we'll do today. Russell, of course, looks like he's going to see out his three-year deal, whether he gets the Mercedes deal in uh, drive in 2021 or not. But it would be 19, 20 and 2021. 20, so maybe Mercedes could do a year with Vettel before they do get Russell on board. That's possible, I suppose, if Vettel doesn't go off and do unpolitically correct F1. Never know. Um, but uh, if Russell did leave a year early, who would replace uh, George Russell at Williams? Um, they have got lots of team uh, test drivers, Jack Aitken, uh, Dan Tictum, uh, Roy Nissany, Jamie Chadwick. So they could choose, choose one of the four or maybe another pay driver like Nikita Mazepin, maybe who's been looking for a seat in F1. They could go down that road. Right. Um, uh, let's do the quiz answers, shall we? And uh, the numbers. No, let's do the, car the, the names. We have Charles and Carlos. What other team teams have had uh, the drivers with teammates with the same name. Carlos Reutemann and Carlos Pace, or Pace, uh, 1974 in Brabham. The Argentine Reutemann and the Brazilian uh, Pace. Uh, Sebastian Bourdais and Sebastian Vettel, did you get that one? Toro Rosso, 2008. And of course, Daniel Ricciardo and Daniel Kvyat. Daniel and Daniel, yeah, it kind of fits. Um, Red Bull Racing in 2015. And the numbers. When have we had last sequential numbers from teammates in F1? Williams, 2017, Massa and Lance Stroll, numbers 18 and 19, and Caterham in 2014, Marcus Ericsson, number nine, Kamui Kobayashi, number 10, added to Daniel Ricciardo, number three, and Lando Norris, number four. There you go, told you it was worth waiting for, which only leaves us for a little trail for the watch along of last year's German Grand Prix, which is always worth watching again, but we can watch it along with Martin Brundle, David Croft, Christian Horner, and the winner of it, Max Verstappen. That's Wednesday, if you're watching this on Tuesday, wet tomorrow, Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Sky F1. But uh, that's it for now. We'll have more notebook, I think, if there's enough to say, next week. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Sky Sports F1. Feel it all.